Hello and welcome. My name is Tom Yamas. I'm an anchor for NBC News and I host a show on NBC News Now, our streaming platform called Top Story with Tom Yamas. I cover presidential elections, the war in Ukraine, the border, and most recently over the past few years, hostage diplomacy. And that's what the topic of this conversation and this panel is all about. <laughs> Just last summer, President Biden declared a national emergency when it came to hostage diplomacy. So what does that mean? Essentially, it's when countries like Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea, Iran, and of course Russia arrest Americans on bogus charges in hopes of negotiating something in their favor for the Americans' release. We've seen this time and time again recently in our news. And today here at the Aspen Ideas Festival, we have the foremost experts, the people on the front lines and a victim of hostage diplomacy. This conversation you're about to experience and witness today is unlike anything we've ever had in this space. And I've done a lot of these conversations a lot here at Aspen. And because of these people here on stage, it's the first time I've had a panel come up and negotiate the terms of the panel. I've actually never had that happen, but they, they wanted to meet, they wanted to talk about what we were gonna talk about. Um, I was able to hold back the questions, which is good. Uh, <laughs> but I wanna talk about our first panelist here. Some of you may know him. If you look at his website on the State Department's website, Ambassador Roger Carson's, it has a few lines about him, right? He's the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. He's a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, served in the Special Forces, graduate of West Point, master's degree from the U.S. Naval War College. But I love how the Wall Street Journal described him. This is how they write about him. When a hostile foreign nation or group releases an imprisoned U.S. citizen, the first American to welcome them home is typically Washington's hostage deal maker in chief, Roger Carstens. The special presidential envoy for hostage affairs was on the tarmac December 8th in the UAE to meet basketball star Brittany Griner when she arrived on a Russian plane. He has one mission in life right now, and that is to negotiate and get the release of American prisoners. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Jason Rezaian, global opinions writer for the Washington Post. He spent 544 days in an Iranian prison. His crime, being a journalist. He was accused of espionage, a completely bogus charge. He became an unwittingly bargaining chip in Iran's international nuclear negotiations. He was reporting from Tehran from 2009 to 2014 for the Washington Post, at the end serving as a bureau chief. He documented his 18 months in prison in his book called Prisoner. As a fellow journalist, Jason, it's an honor to share the stage with you. Thank you. And Danny Gilbert, Dr. Danny Gilbert, who uh, has appeared on my show a few times. She's a friend of Top Story. She's the foremost expert in this field. She's a David and Cindy Edelson Fellow, U.S. Foreign Policy and International Security, the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College. Her research examines the causes and consequences of hostage taking, including the politics of hostage recovery. She holds a PhD in political science from GW, master's degrees from the London School of Economics and the George Washington University, and a BA in ethics, politics, and economics. If you're forming a trivia team, you want Danny on that team. She's got a lot. Um, so, Ambassador, I am a reporter. So I gotta start with the news. And, and I know you're open to helping us out with all this. So in late March, Wall Street Journal reporter, 31-year-old Evan Gerskovich was arrested, again for being a reporter, accused of espionage in Russia. The editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal has called that absolute rubbish. What can you tell us about Evan and, and when are we gonna get him back? Uh, first off, Tom, thanks for hosting this panel. It's a great opportunity to talk about an import, important topic, so thank you for yeah. taking the lead on this. I'd also like to thank the Aspen Ideas Institute for hosting it as well, and hopefully we'll uh, give you some uh, good things to talk about and think about. To, to talk about Evan, um, uh, obviously he's not a spy. I mean, we've been very clear with that with the Russians. The Russians, uh, however, have been playing a tough game. They're not willing to really talk to us about him yet. Uh, I think uh, one of their uh, s senior political leaders, uh, Ryabkov, said that We'll talk to the Americans after we've tried and convicted him as if it's already a done deal. Uh, I think to, to my mind, uh, the Russians might play this out in a long drawn out uh, trial process. Uh, and after a conviction, if he is convicted, and I assume he will be, it'll be time to negotiate his release. Having said that, it's our intention not to wait until a trial proceeds. If we can, we're going to try to find ways to work for his release prior to any trial starting or any trial concluding. 
Right now, he's in a Russian prison right now, waiting a, a trial process. Uh, every 90 days, they extend it another 90 days, so you'll keep seeing that pop up in the news. Eventually, the trial will start, and it will progress probably along the lines that we saw with Brittany Griner, Trevor Reed, and Paul Whelan. Uh, how have the recent events in Russia with the Wagner Group and Vladimir Putin how has that affected Evan's case? So it remains to be seen. Uh, I would say we can't prove it one way or the other, but I will say this. Uh, it's, if there's one surprise I've had in this business in three and a half years of doing this job, it's that the opposing side is always willing to talk to us almost no matter how much tension. I and mean, there have been times when we've been at loggerheads with Russia, and yet we've still been able to garner a release of Trevor Reed and Brittany Griner. Uh, we've been at loggerheads with the Venezuelans. And yet, in a nine-month period, we brought back nine Americans. So my thought is, though, even though the Wagner Group might uh, introduce some chaos and ambiguity into the system, I think that we're still going to find a way to have this conversation and bring Evan home. Could you share the last time you or a U.S. official spoke with Evan? Uh, spoke to him, a U.S. official. Uh, really haven't had a chance. The Russians have not given us consular access. I can tell you that the United States Ambassador to Russia, Ambassador Tracy, had a chance to go to his last, her last, uh, excuse me, his last uh, uh, trial proceedings where he, his uh, detention was extended 90 days, and she had a chance to lay eyes on him, and that's not a bad thing, but we've not had a chance to garner consular access yet, and to our mind, the Russians owe us that. Finally, I think it's fair if I also ask you about Paul Whelan and, and his case and, and what you can tell us about that. Uh, it was uh, Paul been in prison for four years. Been there for quite some time. Uh, uh, one of the toughest phone calls I've ever had is uh, after bringing Brittany Griner home, we landed in San Antonio at 4.30 in the morning, uh, went through uh, some things that you might have to do, like getting people uh, in the right place, right place and time. At 9.30 in the morning, Paul Whelan called me from Russia. Uh, he was allowed to make a phone call, and I had to spend 30 minutes on the phone telling him what happened and why uh, we were unable to get him out at that time. And I said, Paul, the Russians gave us one deal. It was Brittany or no one. There was no opportunity to get you out, and we're not going to stop. My foot's on the gas pedal. We're going 110 miles an hour. We will not relent until we bring you home. And Paul showed, said something that, that really struck me. He said, this is a great day for uh, Brittany Griner. It's a great day for Brittany's family, and it's a great day for the United States of America. And I've always been moved by his strength and resilience. Uh, we're going to find a way to get Paul home. Uh, I regret that it's taking this long. Is there anything the U.S. or anyone we can give Russia to get those two Americans back? Um, would love to tell you. It'd be interesting. It'd make news. You'd be happy. Your producers would be happy. And I'd rather not say anything. Okay. These are the things that the details of the negotiation um, sometimes are no-brainers. You can look, kind of look at what's probably going to take to bring someone home. Uh, in my side, my side of the house, uh, it, it doesn't do me any uh, good to negotiate in public. It's better to just talk to the other side and kind of keep it quiet, knowing that there'll be a lot of speculation out there. But it's a good question. Okay. Ambassador, thank you for being so forthcoming. We do thank appreciate you. that. Jason, 544 days. What's going through Evan's head right now inside that prison? So I, I think it's a question that, that I um, have been asked a few times recently as the 100 days approaches. Um, the, the first 24 hours, 36 hours, week, is a period of confusion. Why is this happening? Is someone co going to come to my aid? Is, every, is, is somebody in the Russian system going to realize that this is a big mistake? What you uh, come to understand pretty quickly is that, no, this is not a big mistake. This is uh, part and parcel of their foreign policy. Um, the days have a way of being, uh, on the one hand, interminable. They feel like they go on forever, but months can pile up and you sort of lose track of time. Uh, I've been really heartened by the images that we've seen of Evan in the court proceedings. Um, because he's sending the world a message. He's keeping his head tall, uh, looking the world in the face. There's a bit of a smirk on his face. He knows how ridiculous what he's being subjected to is. Um, but ultimately, you know, the thoughts that go through your, your mind in isolation, and I uh, assume that he's still in solitary confinement, um, is, you know, when is somebody going to come to my aid? Is somebody going to come to my aid? And will those attempts work? Um, and I can tell you from my experience, you know, the, the, your captors do everything they can to make you feel um, off balance. You know, it's, it's really a game of mental torture. Did you lose hope? 
multiple times, but I always brought it back. You have a very stark decision to make early on in this kind of ordeal. I spent seven weeks in a eight by four foot cell, uh, solitary confinement, where the lights were on 24 hours a day. A lot of things are going through your mind. One of them is, uh, you know, do you go towards despair or do you hold out hope? And it's a very stark choice between being your own best friend or your own worst enemy. I chose to be a friend to myself. I've met others uh, who have come home um, and seemingly made a different choice. Uh, and it's, um, it's hard to unravel that over, over time. Thank you for sharing that too, Jason. I know that's not easy. So Danny, explain to our viewers, wh why is this... Why does it feel like it's happening more? Is it getting more press attention, or is hostage diplomacy truly a national emergency like the president has said? Thanks, Tom, and, and it's really an honor to be here. So there's a few different reasons why it might seem like this trend is on the rise. Um, in, in the first place, we are paying more attention to it. The White House has called it a national emergency and has a special executive order about this rise of hostage diplomacy. And people like Roger and Jason are spending so much time elevating this issue. But there's a few geopolitical reasons that it um, might be increasing that have nothing to do with the attention that uh, is being given to this phenomenon. Uh, hostage taking is a crime as old as uh, written records of war. We have had all different kinds of hostage taking that have affected US foreign policy from the Barbary pirates at the early days of the United States. The 20th century had airplane hijackings that were happening every five and a half days. Uh, embassy sieges where lots of people would be taken hostage and held in place, then decades where people were being kidnapped by non-state actors like rebels, criminals, terrorists um, in Latin America, in the Middle East, really all over the world. But with the end of the global war, war on terror and the end of the U.S. chief geopolitical foe really being uh, terrorist groups and non-state actors, we're shifting back into a geopolitical moment of uh, great power competition or strategic competition, as the current administration calls it, which means that the US's chief adversaries around the world are other states, are autocrats, authoritarians, uh, rulers around the world who want to disrupt the political system that the United States uh, has been upholding for decades now. And so hostage diplomacy is a tool of autocrats and authoritarians. It's a tool that bad actors around the world can use to take advantage of wealthy Western democracies that care about the freedom and liberty of their citizens around the world. So that tees up my next question to the ambassador. Why are we in business with rogue nations? I mean, if we just look at the timeline, you negotiate the release for Brittany Griner in December for a guy known as the Merchant of Death, Victor Bout, and then four months later, Evan is arrested. So my question is, it, it looks like on paper this is good business for Russia. Why would they stop? Uh, great question. I don't think we really know. And, and I'll say this much. I'm glad that Danny's uh, on top of this because really there are only a few people that are really studying this right now. If you're younger and you don't have a PhD yet, and you have to choose a field where no one's done a lot of work. This is the field. <laughs> Come um, work with but me. <laughs> there's a ton of data out there. We've not cleaned the data. We've not racked and stacked it. And so when someone says that if a country takes someone as prisoner and we do a swap or we do give some sort of concession, then it's going, only going to incentivize that behavior. And we honestly really can't prove that yet. There are countries out there, if you mentioned them, you'd say, have they actually taken any more Americans? And you'd sit there for a second and say, well, we'll know they have it. Yeah. With Russia, um, they, took this, uh, they took Paul Whelan, and my, my, my sense is that they wanted to get Victor Boot and Konstantin Yeroshenko, and when they didn't get what they wanted, they took another one, Trevor Reed. And when they didn't get what they wanted, they took another one, uh, Brittany Griner. You, you could make the argument that sometimes if the other side is unable to achieve their objective, they're going to be taking more people. So these are areas that I think we need to explore. I'm grateful that uh, we're gonna start looking at this in earnest, but at the end of the day, my job is to go explore with the other side what's gonna work. Uh, I have to show my math. I have to go through every other option that I can before we get to the final decision. But my job is eventually placed before the President of the United States, a course of action or two that he has to decide upon. Let's talk about your job. Jason, we know the ambassador was appointed by former President Trump, and you took a very bold position. You wrote in the Washington Post that President Biden should keep ambassador in, in, in that job. Why did you argue that? Yeah, Jason, why did you say that? <laughs> 
Well, it's pretty simple. I, uh, you know, in, in the community of people working on this issue and families who are currently uh, struggling with trying to, to bring uh, their loved ones who are being held hostage home, I heard again and again during the transition, we're really worried that uh, Roger's gonna be replaced. Uh, we feel like we have a good working relationship with Roger. Um, and also knowing and understanding the importance of continuity, right? Uh, for a new guy to come in and, and reestablish relationships uh, would have been very w difficult. Um, and I've had the benefit of knowing uh, all three people who've held this position. I, I consider all of them good friends uh, and, and important members of sort of the hostage recovery family. Each one has taken a different approach to, to the enterprise. But what Roger uh, was doing uh, in the, what was it, about a year and a half that you were doing it during the Trump administration? really building out an infrastructure. His predecessors didn't have the resources to do that. He had some resources, he had a vision, and I think it was important to, to let, let that play out a little bit. And so I, I, I wrote that and I stand by it. Uh, I'm glad that, that I uh, made myself heard on that issue. Um, and you know, I think he'll be the first to tell you, he's still got a lot of work to do. Yeah, Ambassador, I, I don't know how you sleep at night, but if you could, and, and I know you can't tell us everything, but movies are made about this, we can hear it from you, you're there. H how does this work? Are, are you, is it several phone calls? Are there translators? Are you flying to Russia? Are you flying to Venezuela? H how does it work? So the, on the sleeping question, I go to bed every night knowing that I have not succeeded in bringing home 30 plus people. And so uh, sleep is, is usually fitful, but every day I think um, I, I wake up, my team wakes up, and we throw ourselves back into battle because we try to treat this as an emergency. The State Department, when you think about diplomacy, you think of slow moving stuff, people in suits and ties. My office is like a hospital emergency room. It's, it's frenetic activity all day long because we know the stakes are huge. There's a life in place, and there are family members that are suffering. In terms of the negotiation, they're all different. Uh, my predecessor said that there would be no cookie cutter and that there's no way to mechanize what we're doing. I thought they were wrong until one day I realized they were right. So every, every, uh, everyone's different. There are times when it might be the U.S. Ambassador Ford that has the relationship and conducts the negotiation. Other times it might be me flying to Caracas, Venezuela to talk to the, the regime. Uh, so they're all just a little different. But I would say here's one thing I'd throw at you is that um, the thing that you need to do in all these negotiations, if I may, is you have to be very human. You know, when I take a look at the four principles of the Aspen Ideas Institute and the Aspen Institute, uh, a lot of it deals with building these relationships and having these dialogues. So you have to bring every part of yourself. You have to be very human. You have to be willing to listen to another side, another side that you very well might not agree with. Uh, you have to be uh, able to be empathetic, to empathize with not only the people you're negotiating with, which could be the Venezuelans, the Russians, the Chinese, but also to make sure that you're showing that same empathy to the families and the detainees and everyone within this enterprise. So it's a job that uh, the negotiations are always different in setting them up to an extent, but I can tell you that if you are gonna do this job, you need to bring your rational side, but you definitely need to bring that human, intuitive, emotionally available and empathetic side in as well. How do you know when you've reached a deal? Because the people you're negotiating with a lot of times are trained in espionage, they're trained to learn how to lie, they're, they're former spies in some cases. How do you know how to read these people? You know, um, I, I can give you one example. I won't tell you what country or who, but uh, I sat down with one person on our first meeting and I said, look, uh, um, thank you for meeting with me. And he said, I have a lot of your cases. I bet you want to start talking about how you're going to leverage me. And I said, actually, I don't. How about you and I just get to know each other for the next three hours? And he was a little taken aback by that. And he said, you aren't going to talk about your hostages? Well, we can do it in the second meeting. I want to get to know you personally because there's going to come a time when your boss is pressuring you, my boss is pressuring me, but you and I have got to trust each other because no one's coming to get this job. It's just you and me in this room. So let's build a relationship of trust and see if we can work it out. Now, I can't imagine me saying that four years ago, because four years ago, if you would have said, well, you're gonna have that kind of relationship with people in some of these countries, I'd say, unreal, they're not trustworthy, this, that, and the other. But I think, again, if you, if you bring your whole self to this, you can have a relationship and a conversation which will eventually result in that person showing up. I, I, we still check each other. I can tell you one thing, when we land on, whenever we do a trade with the Russians, uh, 
we get off our plane, they get off their plane, we meet in the middle, and then I take them over to my plane or vice versa. We identify who we're switching, and then we have that bridge of spies moment. And the reason we do that is just making sure that both sides were honest when it came to the tarmac where the switch was going to be made. And you can watch the most recent one with Brittany, which was captured yeah. on video, and you see exactly that play out. It's, it's actually fascinating to watch the body language and sort of the machinations of that. You mentioned you, you go to bed thinking about 30-plus Americans. So, Danny, I want to ask you, Americans get arrested all over the world. Someone goes to Cancun, has a little too much to drink. They end up in, in jail in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But there are certain parameters for cases to get to Roger. Mm -hmm. What are those parameters? How do they reach that level? So a few years ago, the uh, U.S. Congress passed a law called the Robert Levinson Hostage Taking Account the Hostage Recovery and Hostage Taking Accountability Act, uh, which helps the U.S. government deal with these cases that are effectively different kinds of hostage takings around the world. And the law set up a set of 11 criteria of an international arrest that the State Department examines and looks about uh, whether or not a case meets any of those criteria. So some of them are, uh, for example, that the, there's a terrible human rights record in that country and the State Department's own human rights reports have identified uh, that kind of problem. But there's also some uh, criteria that identify that that person is effectively being held hostage, that they were arrested because they are an American and they were arrested for the explicit or implicit purpose to be used for leverage in a negotiation with the U.S. government. So the State Department looks at all the facts of the case, they gather as much information as they possibly can, and they uh, talk across bureaus and offices and eventually bring the case to the Secretary of State, who determines whether or not a case receives the designation of being wrongfully detained. Uh, maybe some of you heard that yesterday in the afternoon of conversation about Ev Evan Gershkovich and this notion of being wrongfully detained. It's an official designation that means a couple of things. One, they've identified which of those criteria apply in the case, and that that case is moved out of the Bureau of Consular Affairs that supports the safety and well-being of Americans all over the world, and into Ambassador Karsten's purview at the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. So it becomes their case, and it basically means that not only is the U.S. government going to vi try to visit you in prison and make sure that you uh, are being taken care of and receiving your rights, but that the government is going to actively work to try to bring you home as quickly as possible. Jason, you know, you're kind of in a, in a, in a unique spot because you were held hostage, but you're also a journalist. You're still doing reporting on these cases. And I know when you wrote that op-ed about the ambassador, you spoke to a lot of the families who still have their loved ones imprisoned. Uh, talk to me about the role of journalists gathering information, but I got to think you're also a counselor to these people because they're asking you what it's like. So one thing that I wanted to add to both of what uh, Roger and, and Danny spoke about, I think that the culture around this issue has changed a lot in the last four, four or five years. A lot of it has to do with conversations that we've all had um, with a growing number of uh, experts in the field that represent different parts of it, including journalists. And I think that the former inclination was you can't really t trust a journalist, right? Uh, and maybe you can't trust a family member, and you can't trust an academic, and you can't trust somebody at the FBI if you're at the State Department, and you know, on down the list. And I think there's, there's been this realization that we're all kind of in this together, uh, working collectively. So, you know, when a family reaches out to me, whether or not it's a journalist being arrested or, or somewhere, someone else, oftentimes it's somebody in Iran, but you know, it's been all these other countries that we've talked about, I make it very clear right away that you know I have two different hats that I feel comfortable wearing interchangeably, and that I'm not going to break any confidence. And if you don't want me to report on on a case, I won't. If you want my advice on whether or not you should be more public and vociferous about uh, your loved one's plight, I'll tell you what I think. Um, and the same goes for my conversations with, with folks in government. It is, it's a tricky balance, and I don't think anybody else has had to, um, to thread that needle yet. What are the conversations like with the families? Hard, right? Um, in the Iran cases in particular, uh, the, the playbook from one case to another, you know, there's slight differences, but there's so many similarities. 
And you know, in, in, in the cases of Iranian hostages and all of these Americans that, that we're talking about, it's always the, the state propaganda apparatus of those countries that announces the arrest. You know, American arrested on espionage charges, American arrested on drug dealing charges. My advice to these people is to go hard and present a counter narrative of reality, who, who this person is, what they're all about, what they mean to the family. But in the background, they're hearing from others saying, keep it quiet, it's gonna work itself out. I can tell you, these things never just work themselves out, right? right? Someone like Roger needs to step in and you know, public pressure oftentimes helps, sometimes it doesn't. But I think you know, I, I go in it with a, a clear head every time and, and try to give the best advice as, as, as possible. But you know, I've had to, for my own sanity and the sake of my family, you know, put some framework around how much time I can commit to this. Ambassador, on that, on, on advice, we have seen U.S. hostages, and some have very different strategies, if you will. With Evan, we've seen him be very quiet, silent. Uh, he, he sort of smiled when he saw his family at, at his last court hearing. Uh, Paul Whelan has been much different. Sometimes he's carrying a sign. Sometimes he's spoken out to cameras, saying, to pro protesting his arrest. What, what advice do you offer, and, and is there a right thing to do? So the one thing uh, Secretary Blinken uh, often tells families when he speaks to them, and Secretary Blinken's, I talk to every wrongfully detained family, he'll tell them, do what you feel you need to do. You know, if you feel that you have to speak out loud about this, do so. Uh, and he supports that. What do we tell the detainees? In a way, it's up to them as well. And there really is no perfect way of uh, attaining this. What I can tell you is whatever someone does, if a detainee comes out very vocally, the family comes out very vocally, vocally my job is to work around that. There probably are one or two countries that um, if it gets too vocal, they may actually close down the channel. And we at least explain that to the families. Say, look, do what you need to do, but this, is, this, this country in particular if it gets too uh, publicized, it may actually put the channel in jeopardy, but you know, we'll try to work with you on that. Uh, and I think the families, uh, to my experience, have, have done a great job. I, I, I can tell you there, were, there was a time, as Jason was bringing up, when this wasn't really, uh, there wasn't much awareness. And I, actually, I think the media, who I consider to be a partner, I thank them for putting awareness on this whole effort, and it's kind of changed the dynamic. So families feel much more competent and much more free to be uh, very vocal and to increase this awareness and I think overall, in the gross aggregate, that's been a good thing. But regardless, the State Department will work around whatever a family or a detainee wants to do. Danny, I'm going to pose this question to you because the ambassador obviously works for President Biden. There, there are politics at play here, right? We saw it going back to Jimmy Carter and the Iran hostage crisis and Ronald Reagan. There was a lot of pressure on President Biden with Brittany Griner, a lot of pressure. There was story after story being written. H how much does politics play into this? And, and as we, we are approaching a, a, a campaign? It's a great question. So one of the things about hostage taking that makes it attract so much attention from the American public uh, is the notion that it's usually a single individual victim with a name and a face and a compelling story. It's this scholarly idea known as the collapse of compassion that makes it really easy for us as an American, as a, an American public to look at someone in prison and to think about the horror that they might be feeling, that their family might be going through, that keeps attention to these cases for quite some time. And the administration, across administrations, often feels pressure from the public because there is so much attention to these cases. There's also really complicated domestic politics that come out of culture and individual characteristics as they relate to these different hostages. So in some of my research and polling that I've done, one of the things that we know is that the American public is broadly very supportive of hostage recovery of all different sorts, whether that's military rescue missions, whether that's making various concessions, paying ransoms, making prisoner swaps. But at the same time, the public is really aware of the circumstances of hostages' capture. And so there's this idea that if the American public believes that a hostage is personally responsible for putting themselves in danger, for going somewhere that they shouldn't have been, for doing some sort of risky behavior, that causes a lot of controversy. And the American public is then less supportive of the government efforts to bring that person home. Some of you might remember uh, more than a decade back the case of both 
Bill Bergdahl and the idea that there was a lot of controversy around all of the US government efforts to bring back this soldier who had walked off his base. And so there's really complicated politics that involve both the American public pressuring the administration to bring people home. We're Americans, we value our liberty, we value our freedom, we have freedom of press that reports on these stories. All of that pushes in the direction of putting pressure on the administration. And at the same time, it opens up the ability for there to be a big debate about whether or not it's worth it to make concessions to bring someone home who was doing something risky at the time of their capture. So it's very complicated uh, politics that that come up uh, that builds into um, culture wars and that affect a lot of different presidents very differently. Jason, when you were in prison, did you have any information, any outside news? Did you know what was going on? In the first few months, none at all. Uh, and then zero. That, zero. I mean, I didn't have access to you know, uh, the outside world. My wife was arrested yeah. with me. She was released after about three months. Then slowly we were given the right of visitation, she'd come and see me um, once a week for about 20 minutes, would bring little news from the outside world. There wasn't much of it in the early months. One of the things that I think has happened, especially after uh, my case, is, is people kind of becoming more bold in their advocacy more quickly. Yeah. The Wall Street Journal has been a, a great advocate for, for Evan. They have a running live page every day with updates. And a lot of that, I think, is informed by conversations that they've had with the Washington Post and, and what the Post learned from, from our experience. Um, but as time went on, I would get bits and pieces. You know, a guard in the prison would say something. Muhammad Ali uh, made a, a statement calling for my release on my birthday. And my wife came and told me that. And I thought to myself, that's just not possible. That didn't happen. And then the next day, you know, one of these guards came to me and said, Muhammad Ali said you should be released. Maybe we should be thinking about you differently, right? Because, you know, Muhammad Ali is a, a, an American hero, but he's a Muslim he's hero. He's Muslim, yeah. Right? And the, the Islamic world thinks the world of him. And so th those sorts of things started to, to, to come into to my, my world, my very small world. Later in my imprisonment, I had access to an Iranian, uh, a television that had Iranian state channels. And I would come up in, in their news in the context of, you know, members of parliament calling for my execution. But then I learned that every time that there was a, a public proclamation inside Iran, uh, you know, to do something aggressively uh, violent towards me, it was in response to some other, you know, free Jason uh, movement that was going on in, in the rest of the world. But it wasn't until I got out that I was able to see the scope and really understand the kinds of resources that my family, that my employers, that my friends, I mean, I'd spent years tr uh, freelancing, so I knew a lot of people in media, that the US government uh, and that the lawyers that the Washington Post hired uh, had put in to, 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 to get me out. It's Ambassador, very humbling. Yeah, uh, Ambassador, I, there are times, and I, I remember going back to the 80s, seeing Jesse Jackson jump on a plane and, and doing negotiations. And uh, Bill Richardson sometimes is, has uh, been called or sometimes gotten involved with families and, and inserted himself. We've seen Dennis Rodman go to North Korea and be pseudo-diplomat. Not sure what he was doing there. Um, when, when, when that stuff happens, when a, a third party gets involved, does it hurt or help? And are you talking to these people? Uh, we talk to these people. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking to, what, what, to people we call third-party intermediaries. I have a great relationship with Governor Richardson. Um, we try to like find areas where we can help each other, where we can play off each other, and that's the best position to be in. Uh, one thing I'll tell you is that when you bring someone home, uh, it, it takes everyone. It's, it's, uh, it's the NGO community, it's Congress, members of the media, it's our allies and partners around the world, it's people like Bill Richardson, it's the, the awareness. It's never just our office, uh, it's never just the U.S. government. And so uh, the third party intermediaries out there, uh, we have a great relationship with them and I, I appreciate what they do. And if I may, yeah. I'm going to hit something on Danny's uh, question. Or question. Here's what's been fascinating about this job, and that, um, uh, as, as he's mentioned, I was appointed by Trump. I've, I'm now working for President Biden. I've been greatly um, 
surprised and happy to see that this is a bipartisan issue. Mm. Uh, this is something that when we get someone back, you'll get uh, uh, notes from both Republicans and Democrats. And when you take a look at the people that we've had a chance to pull out under President Biden, 29 Americans in a 29 month period have come back. They come from different races, different ethnicities, different economic backgrounds, different parts of the United States. It's like this broad tapestry of who America is. And those are the cases that we usually uh, uh, try to solve. And I can tell you that the president has brought back a lot of people that aren't rich, no one knows about it, don't have anyone advocating on their behalf. But in a way, it doesn't matter. Once you become one of our cases, we are going to pursue it ruthlessly until we bring that person home. And the President of the United States has made a lot of very uh, courageous decisions to get those folks to come back. Um, we have about four minutes before we're going to open it up to questions. So I'm going to ask a final question to each of you. Uh, Ambassador, with you, I'd like to sort of finish where we started. What, what hope can you give to the families of, of Evan and Paul, Paul Whelan? Uh, I talk to them all the time. Uh, we, we have weekly calls with them. and Actually, sometimes they turn into be daily calls. Uh, we talk to the, their friends, their family. We have community calls to keep people informed. Uh, in a way, they already know what I would say, and that is this president's committed to bringing him home, or bringing them home, I should say. The Secretary of State is, and you have a whole U.S. government apparatus that's, that does nothing but this. I don't have another job. I do one thing, this, and I have the full support of the Secretary and the President to get it done. And uh, what I would tell them is what I always tell them. It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. The question is when. All right. Danny, what can people do to educate themselves and, and maybe even support these families who, who are struggling so hard during this time? That's great. So uh, this is an issue that there are a growing number of organizations that work in this space. I will uh, make a plug for Jason has done a podcast, a documentary, uh, all kinds of work at the Washington Post. He can provide us maybe some more details on that. There's organizations called the Bring Our Families Home Campaign, Hostage US, the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation, lots of organizations operating in this space that are not just thinking about advocacy, but are also thinking about how to support families and they need resources to do that. So for example, when you get taken hostage overseas, there's not an automatic mechanism to make sure that the IRS doesn't come for you when you don't pay your taxes. And so there's an organization, Hostage US, that works to support families, not just the psychosocial support and counseling and helping connect them with all of the relevant players in the US government, but navigating all of those really impossible uh, situations that they're dealing with on top of this personal and political tragedy. So check out those organizations. Um, what, one other quick thing is that Jason is co-leading and I'm serving on a new commission at uh, CSIS uh, that's going to be working over the next year and a half to help answer some of these tricky questions about hostage taking and recovery. Uh, so follow along with our work. Jason, I'm going to let you plug all the great work you're doing, but I, I do want to ask you this, and I don't ask this lightly, but if you could share the moment you got out and saw your family and saw your wife. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Um, two things I have to say. First, uh, Roger was uh, integral in uh, helping me with that tax issue. And, <laughs> sent, and it didn't get resolved. I, I ended up having to spend, uh, pay $6,000 in penalties and fees. Senator Coons has just introduced legislation that would uh, make it possible for the IRS not to levy penalties on people who are wrongfully detained. Uh, you would think that this shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Um, Call your but, senator. But Roger and I spent a lot of time talking about this. He lives this work at every angle. Uh, in regards to the, the commission uh, that Danny alluded to, this is truly a, a bipartisan effort. It's co-chaired by Roger's predecessor, former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien and Senator Gene Shaheen. And we've collected a group of people who you know, are working on these issues all the time and want to come up with real policy recommendations that hopefully will make a difference moving forward and, uh, and stop this crime against uh, individuals uh, in the future. For me, um, the, the last uh, 24 hours of my experience, it was reported that I was released on January 16, 2016. I've always been very uh, sensitive about that because um, I didn't get on a plane and leave until January 17th, and it was uh, a really harrowing last 18 hours. Uh, Iranian authorities, authorities didn't want to let my wife uh, get on the plane. Uh, she was an Iranian citizen, uh, not an American citizen yet. 
Um, U.S. officials had negotiated for her to be on that plane, and in, in the last hours, the Iranians tried to pull a fast one. They sequestered her and my wife, my, my mother, uh, who's an American citizen, uh, in a different part of the airport, took their cell phones, locked them in a room for 12 hours. Um, and it was uh, a night of a lot of negotiation and uh, apparently the whole thing almost fell apart. And when I say the whole thing, I don't just mean me and other Americans coming home. The entire JCPOA nuclear deal almost didn't happen um, over me and my family's release. So when we got on the plane, it was uh, a deep sense of um, uh, tension being released, but also of sadness because, you know, my wife was leaving her homeland. I was leaving my adopted home, knowing that in all likelihood I'd never be going back. She came back here, and we're glad you're here, Jason. Thank you. It's incredible. Um, yeah, what a, what, a, what a conversation. We have time for questions, so if you have a question, please go. We're going to hand microphones. Okay, so why don't we start right where you are, right there. Hi, Edith Bartley. I'm an advocate for victims of international terrorism. My father was a career diplomat, and uh, congratulations to all of you for all this really important work. My question is, what are we doing, if anything, as a nation to uh, brief high-profile Americans, students who are traveling, uh, about the proper conduct um, when you're visiting a foreign nation. We are a person's guests, and we have to abide by their laws. And certainly people are wrongfully detained, but we, I think we need to do more as a society to educate school systems, uh, college campuses, to talk to students who are doing study abroad programs, um, to think twice about how they're conducting themselves abroad, and high profile people, because we are uh, in a moment right now, globally, where uh, you know there's a lot of tension and animosity towards the American government, um, you know, lots of places in the world. You want to take yeah. that? How about I start off, Edith? Thanks for that question. Um, uh, there's a website that a lot of people just don't go to. If you're going to go to uh, pick your country, let's say you're going to go to Colombia, uh, do you necessarily get on and look at travel.state.gov? But if you want to get some of those tips, it's on travel.state.gov. It's an ability to, to kind of give you some advice, give you some do's and don'ts, some rules of the road. Uh, I think in terms of something more proactive, believe me, that's something we're working on with members of Congress. They're asking us, how do we get more preventative? The two things we didn't talk about today, prevention and deterrence. And we're starting to spend a lot of time on how do we deter countries from doing this? And how do we prevent this from happening? And the prevention's not just with the other side, the opposing countries, it's with working with our own citizenry. So it's something I would say it's a growth area for, for us right now. I'm glad you brought it up. I can tell you that it has Secretary Blinken's attention. And I think in the coming year or two, we're gonna to try to build out some protocols and programs that will actually address that. But right now, it's an area of weakness right now. I think one area that should be looked at is um, journalists. Our national publications that are sending men and women who are willing to literally put their life on the line to do reporting, we have to rethink what tools on the ground are we giving them to do their jobs um, because it's not rocket science that if you have a um, connection to a country, as you did, Jason, that you're a target. Um, that's just... Common sense, but you okay. got to you got to go and you got to be at the story also. That that it's, it's uh, tough, no, I agree. You know? But yeah. what? But I think their employers need to think more proactively now what things can be done on the ground to protect their own who are doing this important work um, in a very dangerous, uh, sometimes um, threatening. Yeah, position, I can you know, tell you situations. from my anecdotal experience on this over the last few years. You know, the, the numbers of uh, foreign correspondents, American foreign correspondents, is dwindling, yeah. right? Because we, you know, as news organizations aren't willing to take on the same kind of risks. And I, you know, I'm very concerned about, you know, we talk about uh, the need to protect journalists. You know, there's an organization called the Committee to Protect Journalists. I think we need to create the P Committee to Protect Journalism uh, because I, I think we're going to be dealing with a tidal wave of, uh, of foreign correspondents. And, and journalists from these countries that we're talking about exiled, and then we'll have no windows into those places. So we need to come up with solutions to that question. Yeah, we have so many questions. We want to move on. Uh, who, 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 you guys pick. I feel bad. Okay, we'll go here. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, thank you very much. This is a fascinating panel. Um, I was just curious, 
Uh, this is a question really for the ambassador, but what is the federal government doing, if anything, to de-incentivize, like specifically to de-incentivize this behavior? And the sort of addendum to that is that I've always understood that the United States had an official policy of not negotiating with terrorists. And isn't this negotiating with, you know, certainly states that are performing terrorist-like behavior? It's, uh, it's funny, uh, based on the, um, you could say, the presidential policy directives and the executive order, there's a saying that we have in my office is that the United States does not negotiate, no, excuse me, negotiate with terrorists, but we do. And so we are able to, in my office, to go talk to terrorist groups about getting Americans home. Uh, having said that, if I can take your second question first, um, it's a little bit different when it comes to a nation state with terrorism uh, or terrorist groups. We're not really in a position to offer concessions with nation states. We're in different territory. Uh, so we're able to consider some of the things that might, might have to be done to bring them back. They're always hard decisions. The president, uh, usually they, those decisions go all the way up to the president. And in terms of decentivizing, we do have something that came out recently. It's called the D, the D indicator. And it's a warning to Americans not to travel to a country. So there are some countries out there where we st still have some semblance of a relationship. And what you're telling Americans is watch out. If you go to this country, you could actually end up in a prison because they have a history of deterring Americans. Uh, and, but in terms of deterrence, it's something we're working on. If I could have 30, uh, 20 seconds, what we want to eventually do is over time make my office go away. If in 15 years we can uh, show the people that do this that the price of doing so is too high for them to do it, then that's going to be a victory for us. And the way we're going to have to do that most likely is a multilateral effort of other countries that are willing to band together and use some of the tools of their national power, diplomacy, information, military, law enforcement, economic, financial, etc., to uh, out of a toolkit to uh, harness them and, and visit that upon the countries that are the offending countries in order to get them to uh, change their rational decision-making process. So that's where we're going. Kind of like Edith's question, it's an area that's uh, there for growth, and we're going to be working on it very aggressively over the next few years. Yeah, right over here, Jeffrey. I am not being critical at all, but I just, Ambassador, when you're dealing with a situation where you, you have a professional basketball player being swapped for one of the most dangerous men in the world, What's the criticism? How do you deal with that? What's the conversation? Can you talk about that at all? I, I just can't imagine the conversations that go on. And so um, uh, the president makes the decision, and I don't get to go and talk with him personally about what's going on in his head. Let me tell you what I think. Um, before, we made this, before the government made that decision on uh, Victor Boot, we did an exhaustive national security um, analysis and really trying to determine if he's released back into the wild, is he going to uh, be a threat to U.S. national security, to our allies? Will he eventually come back and be the merchant of death part two? And the analysis that we received was categorically no. You know, if, if he goes back, he will not have a residual effect on the national security of us and other people. So I think we felt pretty comfortable on that. If, if the answer is usually no, then that's something that starts to get pushed off, uh, off the to-do list. Additionally, when you talk to most Americans, and I remember right after he came back, uh, 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 Brittany came back, I went to a West Point uh, football game, uh, exhausted, you know, kind of jet lagged, and I had a bunch of classmates come up and like, ask me the same question. So I'm used to the criticism. But eventually it comes down to, you know, would you rather have Victor Boot in a prison on our tax dollars? He looked great, by the way. Muscular, in shape. It's intermittent fasting. We talked about it. <laughs> or do you, want, do you want to have Brittany Griner back in your country? I'll tell you who I want. I want Brittany Griner back in this country because she has a blue passport. And if you have a blue passport, we're coming to get you. And if you have to, to wave Victor Boot for Brittany Griner, no brainer for me. Uh, having said that, I don't want to treat that lightly. When we make some of these decisions in the government, uh, we recognize that uh, uh, there's a fear factor involved. And what my job, part of my job is to explain this to decision makers, members of Congress, the media, and the American public that we've done the math and this is the best deal we're going to get and we feel pretty confident that it's, it's a good deal and it's not going to put people at risk. Yeah. Uh, we've got a good one here. We've got fingers pointing over here. <laughs> Uh-oh. I sense a criticism coming. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, my question, also probably for the ambassador, I was wondering when you bring back a hostage successfully to the United States, does the department provide services for that hostage afterwards to reacclimate into society, mental health services, etc.? So, great question. And I hate saying this, another area of growth. We identified this about two or three years ago, where um, right now, if someone comes back, 
We try to get them to a place like San Antonio. They land, their family's usually there to greet them. The military takes over and conducts post-isolation support activities, PISA. So you might have someone who goes in and gets a full body screening, a mental evaluation, a psychological baseline, you know, so that they can have something that they can take when they finally leave. Some people have stayed in PISA up to about two weeks until they felt physically, mentally, and emotionally ready to move. The families go through some semblance of counseling. But the next phase of this is working up on essentially PTSD counseling for families and the detainee stretching for at least a year beyond that. Uh, we're working with Congress right now. There's a, there's a bill that's up for grabs. It's S509, and it's going to hopefully address some of this. But the, the, really, the bottom line is that this person was taken because of their American citizenship in most cases. So we feel like we have an obligation to take care of the family's emotional and, and uh, mental uh, 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 conditions during the course of the hostage uh, crisis or the wrongful detention and afterwards. And that's, that's definitely the direction that we're going in. So great question. It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm very cheered that people are picking out the directions that we need to go. Jason, Thank you want to add anything to that? Did you, did yeah, I went through one of, uh, one of those um, uh, kind of several day procedures uh, at Landstuhl, a uh, military hospital in Germany. And, um, you know, it's completely optional. I think that's still the case, right? Yeah, it, is. Uh, it is. And for me, it was really critical to my recovery. I mean, those first few days are super important, right? Uh, and being let back out into freedom has its own challenges that none of us are prepared for. So um, I'm a strong advocate for people getting as much help as possible and also for um, legislation like this bill to make it possible for the U.S. government to say, hey, we've got you for however long you need. Because when I came back and I watched others who came back with me struggle with things like um, the IRS and you know other uh, credit scores and all this. I mean, you're just not equipped to deal with it. I mean, you you know have a hard enough time kind of getting out of bed in the morning in the beginning. Uh, so you really need that help. Wow. We have time, I think, for a few more. Uh, you want to go right here, sir? Okay, I want to go back to the 1977 for the case of Billy Hayes that was in prison in uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, how often do you find that uh, you're actually going to have to wait until they break out of jail and go that route, or do you usually just wait for the negotiations to take place? I mean, my advice would be to wait for the negotiations to take place. Um, we, I've, I've had those conversations. I've actually had a chance to talk to people who are being held, our detainees. I can think of one case in particular where this guy was actually exceptionally qualified to break out of a prison. And I thought, you know, you'll probably get out of the prison. You might make it out of the city in question. I'm just not sure you're going to make it the 200 miles to the border. I said, look, hold what you got. We're working on it. I got you. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It may not happen next month, but we're working it. Just, I'd rather bring you home safely as an American hero as opposed to having to negotiate for your remains. So my advice to, the, to this guy in particular, and most, is that uh, these nations, it's, uh, we were talking about this just today, Jason, you're not just getting out of the prison, you're getting out of successive security cordons, and that's a super hard thing for anyone to do, especially if you're not super fluent in the language, know how people dress, know the cultural mores, gets into either this question, you know, what are the right and wrong ways to act in a country? If you break out of prison, you're just an American trying to walk down the streets with everyone looking at you. It's best to wait for us to try to do the job through negotiations. Uh, Thank you. Uh, over here? Yeah. Sorry. Hi. I, I have two questions. You can answer either one or both, <laughs> ideally. The first one is uh, during President Trump's uh, family separation program, I remember there were reports on the way uh, the people detained were being treated. And Jason, you tweeted back then that even in Iran, you were given a toothpaste. Toothpaste, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, does the way the United States treat foreigners in its land affect the way you ask other countries to treat uh, American citizens in their land? That's question one. And the other one, completely un unrelated, on China, exit bans. Are they treated as a uh, hostage, and does it matter that they're applying it indiscriminately to a lot of uh, countries? How, how do you approach this issue? Thank you. So I'll hit the exit ban one. I might need some help on this. The exit ban one, um, we're also working through that right now. I think in the next year we'll finally come to a, 
uh, I would say, a solution on how we address the exit ban issue. And, and Ambassador, uh, if you could explain it real quick. Oh, sorry. Bans, yeah. So you're not arrested. It's, it's, you're just, uh, your passport's taken away, and you're not allowed to leave. So you're essentially detained in a foreign country, but maybe like under house arrest, it's hard to get a job, you can't support yourself. The bottom line is you cannot go to the airport and leave. I think, uh, to my mind, that sounds and looks like a detention. But I think we have to wrestle through some of the administrative requirements to, to firmly come up with a way of progressing forward. Uh, the second question, um, I'm always mindful when I talk to the other side that they have a different reality, and I have to respect that. They may actually see things differently than I do about how we treat their prisoners. But in all honesty, I've gone to some countries and said, look, uh, I have credible allegations of torture for my American, and yet in your country, dental care, um, you know, three hot meals a day, prison gym, uh, access to the law library, you know, there's a difference there. And I'm never afraid to point that out to the other countries that we need to hold each other to the same standard and, and we're actually taking care of your prisoners. I need you to up your game on, on your side. Did, did I miss anything, you guys? I have one thing to add to that. I, I am very cognizant of the fact that um, a lot of these countries are suspending due process in these cases with the excuse that, you know, Evan or Jason or Paul Whelan, this is a national security case. And this really harkens back to, you know, the war on terror and Guantanamo. And they will say this to you in interrogations or in a courtroom. So, you know, the, the rest of the world is paying attention. And it's something that, that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and discussing with my colleagues working on this issue. You know, we have to right some of those past wrongs to, you know, credibly try and move forward with deterrence. Because, you know, if we're going to suspend due process because of whatever reason we come up with, we can't expect Russia or Iran or China not to do the same. Yeah. We got to wrap it? Okay, we got to wrap it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much.